Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you tonight. Um, we've got a very special and interesting, I think, uh, discussion for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about Mental Health Deserves Better. It's our 107th episode. Um, we're finally getting around to talking about mental health in a much more broad context. And we really want you to join in with us. So before I introduce you to our guests, let me hand you over to Dave to show you how you can join in tonight, because we really want to hear from you what you think. Dave? Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, great that you can join us tonight for what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you can join in as well. Uh, the first one is on Facebook Live. All you need to do is head over to the chat uh, and just point, uh, post your comments and your questions. Uh, and obviously we'll try and bring in as many of those as we can, uh, although sometimes it can get a bit hectic over there. So, uh, you know, no promises. Uh, the other option that you've got is over on Twitter. Uh, and all you need to do is use the hashtag MHTV. Uh, and I'll be looking for that tonight and bringing those into the conversation. But without further ado, straight back to you, Nikki. Absolutely. So when we're talking um, to some people who are from um, a discussion, a movement, I'm not sure what we're going to call it, um, mental health deserves better. So let's go around in, in my in my screen. I've got Dan first. So Dan, can you just introduce yourself and say hello? My name is Dan Wander. I am a mental health nurse and lecturer. And uh, I, I'm going to stop there in terms of introducing myself because I could go on, I could tell you lots of irrelevant <laughs> stuff about myself. My first pet was a goldfish called Mickey Finn. There you go. <laughs> My first pet was a goldfish called Jack Spratt. <laughs> Clearly, we were not trusted. I still don't <laughs> no, know. <laughs> that's a that's a program for another day, though. Um, Maxine, hello. Hi, yes, yeah, so I'm Maxine. I'm also better known as Max. Um, I'm a mental health nurse uh, and nurse academic, but I would say my heart belongs to mental health nursing because that's what we want our impact to be. Fantastic, Chris. Yeah, my name's Chris. Um, also a proud mental health nurse. I guess that's why we're all here today. Um, Funnily enough, never really owned a pet. Um, I don't know what that what that says about me, but yeah, no, I've not really owned any pets. So uh, um, yeah, that's me. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about this kind of hashtag MH deserves better, and you'll be seeing it everywhere. And so do feel free uh, during the course of this to to look it up and and see um, some of the discussions being going on about it. But I guess one of the most important things would be just to define what it is. So if anyone wants to jump in and just uh, just tell us a little bit about how it came about. It almost feels like a once upon a time story now because it actually feels like it's been a really, really long and kind of interesting year in, in many ways. Um, so essentially, I, I'd sent an email to Mental Health Nurse Academics UK mailing list in January now, uh, just essentially saying, is anyone noticing kind of direction of travel with mental health nurse education? Essentially, mental health nurses seem to be getting less mental health in their programmes practice assessment document seems to be kind of laden with physical health skills, seems to be distracting from uh, the job that they're eventually going to be doing. Um, and I can only describe the response as like a flood, like a flood of solidarity. And it quickly became clear that this is a national problem, that this is a problem across the entire United Kingdom to varying degrees. You know, I mean, I think there are sort of differences here and there, um, but a huge, huge amount of feeling that this needed to change. Um, and basically from that point, we uh, set up some meetings because it was that sense of like, all right, everyone's feeling this. Maybe we should try and do something about it. And um, so since uh, January, we've met sort of every kind of four to six weeks uh, I think we've got around uh, kind of about 90 people on a mailing list now. And it is, it's snowballing. You know what I mean? It's like there's people getting in touch all the time and they're being added to it. Uh, and actually the, the hashtag has started to kind of grow. And, and actually I'm now hearing about people hearing about it that we haven't told as well, which is, that's exactly what you want to happen with a movement. And uh, you were asking what it was, if it was a movement, uh, Nikki, I, I really hope it's the beginning of some kind of, revolution and I, I don't say that lightly <laughs> because I, I do think there there needs to be a sort of a, a, probably a revolution of thought in, in terms of how we understand mental health nursing and and how we kind of prepare people for it um and and yeah now we can we've got a, a sort of manifesto that's up uh, on um on a wordpress site and uh, there's a twitter page uh, as well so um as something that the group can use to um facilitate kind of conversations and to kind of get the message out there mm -hmm. i don't know if i've forgotten anything there uh max and chris sure about... we'll come back around to it does anyone want to add anything to that to the idea of it 
I just think for me in the sense of the, the word revolution, I think in the sense of sometimes people think that might be like a negative, oh, you know, it's a bit scary type thing, but actually it's really positive, isn't it? That to us in the sense of revolution means actually a positive movement going forward, that actually it's not trying to cause trouble, it's trying to create benefit and create it across everything. So in the sense of I think that one of the, the things that were really important is to say that it's mental health deserves better. And that was across the board in life, across all our nursing professions. And um, so absolutely, we're here to talk about mental health nursing, but it's also to talk about mental health and that our mental health service users deserve better across the board. So I think that's mm -hmm. just that to add, really. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's sort of done what you were saying was this idea that we've got a new curriculum. It's not that new anymore. I think we're in year three or four of that curriculum. And as it's played its way through, the BSE takes three years for you to get from start to finish. Um, it's become apparent that a lot of the space that was perhaps taken up in the past by um, things that were mental health specific have been squidged out um, in order for people to have physical health skills. And we all agree, I'm sure, that nurses need to understand physical health skills. And we do have this pressure of sort of, the need for parity of esteem. I wonder if you've got any thoughts about that. So what's happened, why it's happened and why it's an issue. Yeah, um, it's it, it, like, I, I think it's one of the most frustrating myths that mm, yeah. what this is about is mental health nurses not wanting to do physical health skills. Yeah. Uh, and I would certainly say what it is about is it about mental health nurses not wanting to do irrelevant physical health skills or skills that they're very unlikely to use uh, in in the day to day kind of um, tasks of a, a, a kind of mental health nurse, and I think there's there's certainly a worry for me around that stuff in what I would sort of describe as a bit of an illusion of competence. So if you train to do a skill, say it's nasogastric tubes or kind of catheterization or something like that, stuff that I never did, uh, certainly kind of day to day uh, working on a ward, and then you're signed off as competent doing this skill, but then maybe years go by and you never use it because you're working in an environment where it's not needed you're still signed off as competent to do that skill and actually your only sort of reasonable response at that point is probably say I can't do it because I've not done it in years and it's not safe for me to do this so it feels it feels like a, a huge waste of time to be honest um, and, and also potentially dangerous because maybe people would try and do those skills I don't know. Um. I think generics are a really strange term, isn't it, in, in the sense of, um, and I think there's a lot of debate about it, because I suppose it depends on what people think generic means, but for me, generic is very adult-centric, so in the sense of there's not an equal divide, so to me, generic means that if you've got three, four fields of nursing, you've got learning disability, mental health, adult nursing, and children, that means you should have 25% of that genericism module on those fields, and that doesn't happen, um, and that's, uh, there's many reasons for, for why that, but I think that across the board, across different institutions, different places that I know, that's very rare, um, if ever, that that happens. So I think generic for me actually means adult-centric mm. um, rather than actually being generic in its, its true form. So for people who aren't, who aren't that clear, there are four fields of nurses, as you said. Yeah. But in numbers, they're very differently represented. So learning disability nursing, I think, is the smallest. Um, yeah. And what's happened for learning disability nurses, and if you are a learning disability nurse, feel free to chop in right now, um, is that it's almost the fewer people have tried to study for it, the smaller the spaces that have been offered, uh, uh, the number of courses have closed down, it's actually harder to train now, there's this idea that people who, ha who have learning disabilities can be served by any nurse, and technically that's true, any nurse can support someone with a learning disability. But it's much better to have someone who's a specialist in it, who loves that. In the same way, if you have a cardiac problem, you want a cardiac nurse. <laughs> you know? So there's something around the idea that, you know, we all have like different skills and we have different areas of interest and we all have uh, different populations who are best suited to serve. Mm -hmm. And I think because the adult nurses are often twice as big as the other parts of the course, we get this default expectation that what suits an adult nurse suits all the other branches of nursing. And that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. So... In terms of like people beginning to speak up about this and sort of like contact with the with our governing body, the NMC, can anyone sort of just clarify what's gone on there? Yeah, well, I suppose I could come in there and not uh, sort of said anything so far. Uh, just to kind of talk about uh, uh, this kind of generic point about genericism, there are there, I think there are a couple of uh, prevailing arguments um, as to what the curriculum is doing, uh, what HEIs are doing, and what the NMC syllabus is doing. 
um, and I think that uh, particularly within, within the group that, that we're a part of, um, mm. we're, we're we tend to believe there's a problem with the syllabus. There's, the, there's a problem with the with the with the NMC curriculum or the standards that they mm. produced in 2018. Mm. And I guess that's what led to a, a paper that we that we wrote at, at, at University of Central Lancashire. Um, I, I always kind of term it as that because it feels like a very university paper because we we all had a say as what we felt was wrong. Um, so so we so we we we, we published a paper on it. And what we did is, um, I think it made a little bit of noise. I think it, I think it resonated in in the same way as what um, this mental health deserves better type mm. campaign has as well. Mm. And so the, the NMC made contacts. They did. So thank you for bringing that up. And 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 they also invited um, Dan. I hope you don't mind me bringing you in here. It's a, it, it, into a, a meeting where a, really exciting actually because one of the things that we said on the paper was is we asked the NMC to uh, um, rethink their standards and engage with us and and you know what absolutely fair do some they 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 there they, were representatives of the NMC that met with us um, and we sat down and we had we had a conversation um I think it probably is I think it's probably um important for me not to share everything that happened in that meeting but at least give you a sense of what uh, some of the things that I, I sort of yielded from that and, and how we might move forward mm. and so um quite quite a productive meeting uh, we got to meet with them they met with us it was was really really interesting um however they didn't agree with us they didn't agree that the standards were a problem um and 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 that that wasn't the sole issue so so the argument that we make is that um the the, the standards are so generic they're mm. so broad and base, um, using kind of like generic language, mm. that it creates this problem. And this problem is that um, it leads to generic nurses because there's no room for specialty. Um, and so it, it, became, it we had this conversation um, and, and, and this kind of idea of, of genericism that Max alluded to was rejected by those from the NMC who, 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 who represented them. Which was kind of disappointing for us, really, because that's that's the sole reason why we were there. Um, and, and so, one of the things that I I wanted to use this platform for is is for those of you who 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 are listening tonight, who are engaging uh, with, with this with this um, MHTV episode, is if you do believe that 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 there's a problem with the standards, so I'd, I'd like you to kind of. Um, sort of tag the NMC news in um, with MHTV and tell them that 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 you think there is a problem with the standards. It just has to be a short line on Twitter, just mm. that the, the the standards are a problem, they're too generic, more needs to be done. Mm. Because our arguments didn't seem to convince them, which was a real shame. Um, so they have met with us. We do have another meeting uh, and we're really grateful for, for, for those people who who engage with us. But we also want them to be convinced that it's not simply a HEI problem or, mm. or a curriculum development problem, but it's actually a problem specifically with the standards. And so uh, while the meeting was productive, we unfortunately didn't convince them of, of our position, but we will carry on and, and so will the Mental Health Deserves Better group. Dan, what did you think with, with the meeting? Yeah, I think you've emphasised probably the most important thing there, Chris, is that people continue to make some noise about this yeah. because I think they were quite clear that the mm. concerns that we expressed, they haven't been hearing them. Um, and I, I sort of raised the concern that potentially they weren't asking the right people the right questions in the right way um, mm. because it's all I hear, particularly because I've written quite a bit this year, people get in touch from all over the UK uh, about this issue and and they're they're really upset by it mm. you know what i mean students are upset by their courses academics are leaving uh, institutions saying I, I don't believe in this people mm. are experiencing moral injury and um, so i i find it sort of disappointing that they weren't hearing that because i know those voices are there yeah. um and i think it's really important that uh, for anyone that's listening that you, you use that voice and yeah. get that voice out there and certainly a part of the, the Mental Health Deserves Better campaign is that there's a hashtag that people can use. So it's almost a collective banner that we can use to sort of share this idea and say, yes, lots of us are experiencing this and we want you to pay attention, want you to do something about it. Do you think that there's an issue with um, mental health itself not being really great at defining its skill base and its importance? 
yes for everybody who wants to uh, so, yep. so, on that form. <laughs> so can, I, i'd like to just come in here if that's all right because this kind of thing gets me excited uh, and, yeah. and there's a reason for that because you're absolutely right that is the yeah. case um and and again in the article we track this a little bit but we didn't have the room with the, with the word count that we had um, so within the, within, the, within the article and within the literature, um, it, the, the, the kind of language that it uses is that it's tacitly known for those on the inner circle of the profession who can look at another professional and see exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. But that phenomena is really difficult to capture because it's talking about irreducible concepts like empathy, compassion, these things that are so difficult to grasp in a philosophical way. Mm -hmm. um, so what 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 we're doing uh, within the group and within uh, the institution that I work in is we're actually trying to capture that and map it out. Um, we're doing that in a philosophical way. Um, so we're, we're trying to conceptualize some of these things that we do well. Mm. And we're not we're not enumerating them. We're not kind of listing them and quantifying them because we don't believe in that. What we're, what we're talking about is these is these things that are not necessarily um um, solely attributable to mental health nursing. We see that in our wonderful adult colleagues and particularly in our mm. wonderful ch children's college and nursing uh, and LD colleagues, um, but that we're operating in different arenas. We're operating in, in, in different places. So we argue within, within the paper that um, we, we meet the whole person, but we meet them when they, when they are needed and we, we meet the personhood perhaps first before we meet the systems, the organs, the cells and so on. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think if, if, if I can speak for mental health nurses, that that is our primary purpose is to meet the person mm -hmm. at the time when they need them. And, and when I mean by the person, it's the personhood. Um, so mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right, Nikki. I think that uh, um, we're, we're not great at defining what we do, but it's because um, it's too difficult to 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 list to quantify um, what it is that's happening, particularly within the interlocutor. Mm. I wonder if, as well, maybe it's a little bit a bit more nebulous than the times really yeah. encourage. You know, we've lived through the CBT ten sessions or your money back situation yeah. when people thought they could address poverty and disenfranchisement with you know, a handful of Prozac and ten sessions with someone reading out of a book. And I think there is something about us being a lot clearer about what we're, what we're trying to do as mental health nurses and, and what, our, what our structure is in terms of our professional sense of self. And we, I can think of so many nurses who are amazing mental health nurses. And then you say, what does a mental health nurse do? And they're like, oh, yeah, we be with people. And I can understand why something like that is really frustrating to someone who's, who's creating a kind of tick box mm -hmm. for practice development kind of yeah. you know for, for practice assessment and they want like venipuncture <laughs> to tick off and tick off and tick off and like well how do I even okay you're going to be what, what does that even mean yeah well, I think that we do need to be a lot more clear I, about what we're doing and why we do it differently I, I think there's a problem there as well just simply with um, um which sort of um, predates the NMC uh, um, new standards, which was the um, Lord Willis and, and the Shape of Care and Review and, and, and how that has been tracked. Um, I, again, they, they try to have a look at nursing as, it, as its entirety and, say, and, and look at what the population needed, mm. but they didn't give its kind of due, uh, a, a, a due um, assiduousness of, of, what, of what mental health nurse is do well and, and how we help to keep people well. Um, and sometimes we get that wrong. I think that needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a balance of paternalism here versus subjectivism. So the, the, there are some real difficulties and challenges, but um, primarily the, the principles that we have are to meet the person. Um, but like you say, that doesn't look good on a on, on some sort of uh, renumeration, enumeration kind of tick list, does it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really difficult in a sense. It gets me a little bit, um, yeah. I think for me, it's because truly, and I don't take this across the board, but it's because we just literally do not, um, the society, and that means the government and certain people in power, just don't value people with mental health conditions. So in the sense of because of that, then that leads into us, then there's, 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 there's that theory, isn't there, that because we work closely with people with mental health conditions, that then we're not valued, so we lose our voice. Because actually, especially when the way that everything's going, in the sense that we're very much talked, we talk about um, depression and anxiety and things like that. And there's, 
these people that are really struggling with very complex. I'm not saying that people with those conditions that don't have complex. Do you know what I mean? We, we shift in and our conversation shifting and we're not allowed to talk about these things mm. um, because they're not quantifiable. So again, I don't sometimes think it's about us having to articulate. It's the fact is that other professions actually just need to respect the fact that it's actually really difficult and so skillful to be human, have a someone that sometimes isn't in our world. Yeah. You know, that their, their, their distress is so beyond our conception, but we can still be present with them and we can still give them that hope and that empathy. And then, to, but that, that isn't understood by people. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's, you know, I just get, yeah, it gets a bit, because I always say to people, so I was going to go on a right round now, but in the sense of <laughs> going into this, so when you go look into to research, they'll go, oh, we're really interested in people. A lot of people, researchers are interested because all we want to do is be able to quantify people and put them in numbers. People, mental health conditions, people, human beings, do not live in those those worlds do it and we need that connectivity and because of the numbers and we're not going to we might go on numbers in a minute but because of numbers in pre-reg education we cannot encourage and learn about that connectiveness and they can't do it in practice because they're too overstretched so where is that connectedness coming from and it's a loss and we're gonna people are going to really really struggle so mm. sorry for going on yeah no i think i think it's a really really good point there it just made me think i'm reading a book just now called capitalist realism and uh, <laughs> thanks to thanks to mick mckeown for uh, yeah, putting me on to that it does sound like a mick recommendation <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's brilliant i absolutely love it but yeah. it just talks about there's a, a chapter that says all that's solid melts into pr and i think mm. that there is something i think within society not just kind mm. of nurse education where it becomes much more about the way things look than the way things are yeah. now you could get a list of all these brilliant and amazing skills and whatever you need and you could tick all the boxes and say what a fantastic course yeah. but the point you were making there max is that like you need depth you know what i mean so you could tick the box with one sentence on a powerpoint slide that doesn't mean that a person knows that well enough to be able to provide quality yeah. care for another human being yeah. uh, and so we need depth we need time uh, we need to spend time building relationships with students you know what i mean so that we can role model those skills as human beings ourselves and um, not just what what it can feel like which is just a kind of conveyor belt this mm. sort of big factory uh, that makes sort of nurses which is actually probably more of a political football than anything so mm. we can say that we've got this amount of nurses mm. and then my question is but what is the quality of those yeah. nurses mm. I've got a question from a student. Then we'll go over to Dave, who's got a ton of questions coming in. But you can hear the binging going. That's people piling in. Really, I have to say, people, your questions are really long, guys. Just one point. <laughs> like, it's going to take Dave all night to read these out. But the question I've got from a student is, what should be in my course then? Which I like as a question. Well done. So you get one student saying, what should be an ideal mental health course? Can I is go? It? Yeah. Yeah, so I definitely don't believe in idealism or perfectionism. I think they're just concepts that, again, we can't achieve. I think that we ha I think that's a really question that we were good look at ourselves in the sense of what is it? But I think, again, we don't engage with the, the consumers, the, the service users, the people that we're trying to deliver a course to. Sometimes they'll say that they've engaged with a certain amount of people and then they say, oh, that's the whole across the board. So I think... I think it's an absolutely amazing question. I'm not being a politician, I promise you, when I'm not answering the question. I think it's definitely, because mental health has moved on, you know, and I think that we need to move on with it um, and give people the, the skills and to allow people, like Chris um, alluded to before, not to be so paternalistic, even though I know that's a really difficult thing because of the, the ethical issues we have sometimes in mental health nursing. So, um, just, a, just a quick... Uh, add on to that. Um, I don't know what's in that their course. Uh, it's a brilliant question. I don't know what's in their course. Uh, um, so it's hard to know what, uh, what should be in there. But I, I guess the principle in which my first thoughts were, were um, something that Dan said earlier, that uh, um, if we've got redundant skills um, that we're asking uh, um, nurses or student nurses to do, what can we replace them with? And, and to be honest, um, the answer is, 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 is probably endless. Um, and, and I'm thinking about how um, how philosophy could help, how an understanding of phenomenology and, and interpreting somebody's somebody's distress and how you might understand that, um, how you might then uh, um, work towards um, helping. You know, the difference between we could spend an hour on the difference between discovery and recovering, what that means and how that what that might mean to you as opposed to to, to someone else. So um, to, to, there is so much to be said. 
Um, and, and to bring it back to that early principle that, um, it, that that are not found, in my opinion, within the standards. Mm-hmm. And so what, what I would be certainly calling for is for a review of those NMC standards so that we can we can let Max, Dan, I and all my wonderful nursing academic colleagues to, to, to give what I would uh, um, suggest or replace some of those redundant skills that, that, that Dan was learning to to something much more rich and much more, um, we talk, term it in the paper, as, as a different type of critical analysis uh, that we feel mental health nurses need. Dave, can we come to you or do you want me to read the questions out? Uh, you certainly can. I don't know if you want to have a look at the questions because you are you always love kind of sort of paraphrasing better than I do. And <laughs> I, I think I, I think I'd frustrate you when I just read them out verbatim. But don't just frustrate me because I'm professionally trained not to be frustrated. <laughs> well, I, I suppose while you've been talking, I've been thinking a, a few of the, the sort of points that you've raised that I just wanted to come back on. Uh, one of them that I think is really interesting is that kind of comparing with the different fields of practice. Uh, one of the things that we've seen with learning disabilities, for example, is an absolute recognition that the majority of people know ridiculously little amount of information about learning disabilities and that's obviously why there's been a huge campaign run by a parent whose child died uh, and has now changed the the law to say that uh, NHS staff have to uh, have a a, a module uh, on, on learning disabilities uh, to, to sort of, you know, to, to, to improve their practice. And I suppose it's that kind of thing about the interplay between that issue and this, this issue about, you know, how much do the three fields of nursing that aren't learning disabilities learn about learning disabilities? Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, we sort of spend a lot of time saying mental health nurses should be much better on physical health, but actually, should they not be much better on physical health, but be much better on learning disability uh, health or child mm. health? And mm. and it's that kind of thing, isn't it, about the the, the bigger kind of arguments. Uh, already the mention tonight about Lord Willis, and, you know, we were really concerned when they were talking about shaper caring uh, and our members, you know, voiced concerns about heading towards the Australian model and, you know, not having the specialisms in the field of practice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, one of the concerns I've often raised is about nursing associates not being able to have that specialism either and, you know, being, you know, is there a danger of being too generic? Uh, the the other, the one last thing I wanted to mention before Nikki brings in those questions uh, is that we, I've just had a look at the response that Unite submitted uh, way back when they were uh, you know consulting on the uh, NMC uh, standards as they are now uh, and just looking at uh, page seven of the thirty two page response that we put in uh, our members identified a number of concerns uh, in attempting to map the draft procedures from Annex B. There was three headings, 14 subheadings, and that meant 92 procedures. But if you looked at the uh, hospital, the Royal Marsden Hospital Manual of Clinical Nursing, there's actually 223 procedures in there. So actually, you know, why is there that disparity? And, and, And it goes back to that point about, you know, do we want to fill nurses' heads so full in three years, Absolutely. but then for the rest of their career, they don't use 95% of it. And mm. one of the things that we did as part of our response uh, was I sat down with a few of our newly qualified mental health nurse members who'd mm. learned on the old process and kind of said to them, imagine you'd been taught how to do these clinical skills. How many of them have you would you have used in the first six months or 12 months of practice? And they were kind of saying, maybe three of them would have been helpful, maybe four. It wasn't maybe 50 or 60. And again, that kind of bit about how do we kind of prioritise the right things so we do this really, really well. So, Nikki, sorry, I've, I've not sort of... I've got kind a of on in. there. It kind of fits in. Do you, shall I, how about I read these questions and you guys just pill out anything you want from them? <laughs> okay. like, I'll read the questions and just answer what you like. <laughs> uh, so, lovely Karen Wright. Hello, Karen. Um, there used to be a roller coaster on Blackpool Pleasure, Pleasure Beach called the Revolution. Um, it means we're so for me, um, a revolution means we're embarking on a really exciting journey where we get to ride the wave of change and benefit nursing and those who we work with. Again, she was pointing out we need to ask a lot more uh, about to students, practice assessors, and service users um, about what needs to happen. And again, there's some kind of discussion there from Michael Hassan. Hello, Michael, saying um, I imagine that the NMC feel it's the implementation that's the issue here rather than the standards, which are open to 
um, AGIs to interpret and Karen's um, responded to that saying, how many ways are there to interpret a list of proficiencies? It's close to task allocation, which was outlawed in the eighties in favor of person-centered care. Feels like we're going backwards. Mm. So we've got stuff there on, um, I think we need to. I think yeah, I think you need to jump in there and just say what wonderful, what, what wonderful comments. Um, and uh, I, I think that is something that that, that has been um, kind of uh, that, that that it might be a HEI problem, how it that that, that they've interpreted mm. the standards wrong. Um, so it's a wonderful uh, question. Uh, in it, we're here talking about mental health deserves better within within the group, as Dan alluded to. It goes across the four the four nations. Uh, um, and I think we have representative uh, from from different universities. It's, it's about thirty or forty different institutions who have yeah, all joined sure. up. Sensible. I mean, th- th- there's something there, isn't there, that to, to grab hold of? There's something to say. Oh, actually, is it a, an interpretation of all or every HI, mm-hmm. or is there a problem much further upstream? Yeah. Uh, and that's the question again. I want to pose to our listeners: Is is there a problem? If you think it is, please do tag the NMC News and just say, "Look, we think there's a problem with the standards. Mm-hmm. Uh, re-engage with mental health deserves better." Mm-hmm. Yeah, might you say, Chris? Sorry, go on, Dan. Yeah, I, I think just I think there's another issue in there, and I don't think we can let the NMC off the hook with it. To be honest, because I mean, you you do the simple maths and you look at the point where they're what started to be mass dissatisfaction from mental health nursing and you trace that back to the standards but if you look on the NMC's own website they talk about three stages in this process where they set the standards they're implemented by uh, a uh, approved education institutions on their website and then the NMC approve these courses as well so it starts and ends with the NMC so I don't think they can get out of this to be honest um Mm. I do think that there's certainly a role for uh, education institutions to pay attention to this closely Absolutely. and think about how they engage with their mental health nurses uh, that are teaching their the, the future kind of um, future mental health nurses. Um, but the NMC can't really sort of back away from the fact that they have a huge role in this. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was just about saying. So, so they validate the course. And it's like mm. practice as a nurse. You need to show if you're handed over a task, you need to know that that person is accountable and responsible and able to carry out that task. So they need to come back in, don't they? And and you know check to see what is this. You know, what is this about? Have they understood? And like you say, it's very difficult to. We all do our curriculums in isolation, so it's a, oh, got it so wrong. Um, but yeah, so I think they definitely have to um, come back in for me as well, in the sense of I think there's something that they can do um, quite quickly. So and I always get confused, but they basically since our numbers are not commissioned anymore, that universities can cap their own numbers, can't they? So they can say this is how many we want, which probably might lead to to issues itself in relation to um, you know how we respond to those students. But the NMC could come in like they have done with the midwives and said that there needs to be a minimum um, number of academics to a number of personal students. Because I know some um, institutions that have 40 personal students and that's a massive amount of number. And again, like what we were discussing about before, how our, our bread and butter, our everything is about connection. It's about therapeutic alliance. It's about uh, you know. So how can you do that when you've got that many pe- that many people? You know, it's it's really really difficult. So they have a, absolutely done. They have a responsibility, and I would say an accountability. We and that's why we're here because we can't ignore it. They have to come and they have to be check and have the conversation. You know, to say you know what is not just listen, you know, but actually really listen, and just actively mm-hmm. listen to us. And there's a couple of points as well to build on what you're saying. So one. Whilst there are tons and tons of mental health nurses in academia, sort of working between practice and academia and generally in academia and being researchers and all these sorts of things, in each institution, there might only be a handful. So whilst there's tons of us, when HEIs get to to develop and interpret those, there may be five in a group of 60. And that's when you start to get these issues of specialisms being overlooked. And Alfonso Pizzella, hello Alfonso, is, um, I think, reinforcing a point you made Max about reflective stigma so and I might be stating the obvious but I think there's something to do with the fact that mental health isn't understood and taken seriously as physical health there's mm-hmm. a lack of understanding from public uh, perception but also from our own colleagues leading to the voice of mental health being um, suppressed which is a, a really interesting word I think um, Christine Thompson said uh, many adult nurses feel there's a lack of mental health content in the NMC when they need to do their role and I think everybody who's ever taught anything's had that experience where someone will ring up from child or adult nursing saying can you can you come and teach the year ones you've got an hour to tell them everything they need to know about <laughs> mental health and you're like 
Yeah. 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 You've taken two hours to teach them venipuncture. <laughs> yeah, but, um, Michael Hazen's joined in. A very good point on proficiency. Proficiency in this content is a misnomer if we consider its use in, in relation to Ben as novice to expert. So that's obviously looking at actually our nursing um, philosophies. And this is a, refle a reflective um, discussion or doing the skill once in a skills lab and then never doing it again doesn't make you proficient. No, it makes you dangerous. <laughs> yeah absolutely it's a bit like see one do one teach one I was like actually that's not a very good idea <laughs> at all <laughs> even the medics don't do that anymore so like come on guys but there's a kind of as well a bit of a lack of understanding about adult education as well in all this isn't there mm -hmm. it's understanding that like a nurse is like a computer bank you feed the program in and it's there forever and that's not how people remember or learn and it's not what they need to remember or learn so it's like it's not just that they devalue and misunderstand mental health or devalue and misunderstand nurses if i have a, yet another nurse tell nurses what nurses should be doing mm -hmm. <laughs> it yeah. makes me cross that we let them yeah but then on top of that you've got the education stuff they don't understand either yeah. so it's misunderstood from all angles max are you going to say something yeah i just think that we're really missing a massive trick out in the sense of when i when we the, when we went to uni when we brought nursing to a nursing degree program it was to make us have the ability to question wasn't it it was to make us have the ability to challenge you know, and I think that we're teaching now, we're not, we're, we're not even teaching, we're educating people, training people to be robotic. So in the sense of you do the, like you said, Nick, so you do, you do these things and you can do this. Whereas mm -hmm. we're missing that ability. People are going out there that actually don't have the ability to confront and challenge and stuff and, and actually don't question, oh, this is what we do. Do you know what I mean? So I think for me, the nursing, we are, it does, and I hate it because it does sound like we're going backwards and we have to go forwards. We have to create people that leave the profession, leave training on fire to change the world. And I know from my experience, mental health nurses, God love them, and nurses are just like this, flat when they're just about to qualify because they don't know and they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it, honestly, we just, we need to like say, create that passion. The way we create that passion is making that those people, they know that the people in front of them are human and they need to make that connection. And that's living with uncomfortableness, not knowing, not, not, not having to avoid, you know? And I think that's, and we don't have this, because we don't have the numbers, we mm. can't do that in a safe space in class because we can't make them feel uncomfortable because there's 150 of them in front of you. So you mm. can't walk them through it. Mm. Jane Fisher uh, commented, as a service user, I know how, experience, how it feels to experience care for mental health nurses is robotic and lacking in basic compassion and empathy. I'm sorry that that's been your experience. Um, as service users, we deserve better. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. Uh, Karen Wright said, what do you think it would take for the NMC to pay attention or do something different? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's there's definitely something about numbers. Um, and I think certainly um a few of us have felt quite vulnerable, sort of speaking out individually, uh, certainly throughout the year, having our names on papers, kind of the presentations, that kind of thing. There needs to be, I, I mean, there needs to be a movement like mental health deserves better. There needs to be a sort of a, a collection or a, like this mass snowballing of this voice that just will not stop, mm. will not go away and keeps getting louder until they cannot possibly ignore it. Um, mm. And I think doing things like this, you know what I mean? I think we're certainly very keen as a group that we uh, use the sort of academics that we've got in the group to write, to create arguments, to conduct research, to have discussions. Mm. But we also want to feel safe to do essentially what we're supposed to be doing, which is mm. thinking critically so that we can end up providing the best care for people. And actually, all we're saying is that we want mental health nurses to be prepared better so that they can deliver better care for you, for mm. you, for anyone that's listening, for you, for your families. And I think when you pull it back to that, you know, I mean, I always pull that back to back. If, if you're ever struggling with empathy, pull it back to what would I want for me? What would I want for my daughter, for my son, for my wife? What would I want for these people? And I would want better. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely want better. And I think maybe the NMC need to have a, a real think about that and really try and understand mental health nursing, not just from mental health nurses, but from people that have experienced mental health care. Um, and we need to think about how we sort of move forward and co-produce a curriculum, not just have curriculums that are sort of given to 
mental mm. health nursing, stuff that's actually developed by mental health nurses with uh, service users, people with, with lived experience. Um, so yeah, that's that's some things that that we can maybe do. But I think just persist, keep going. Uh, Max, you said a trier, and like I love that you're just just going to try. And I think that's where this came from. Just going to have a pop. Let's yeah. have a pop at making some noise and see where this goes. Um, and I'm doing my my PhD just now, so I'm analysing data today and talking about one of the key skills of a mental health nurse being persistence, yeah. not giving up because it's not there's no easy solutions. Yeah, absolutely persisting um frank colville said i can't wait to do my blood transfusions on the acute wards when i graduate as a mental health nurse so um well, watch out frank <laughs> <laughs> i can't tell if that's a threat or promise or a joke <laughs> joke <Yeah. laughs> fingers crossed um jane's talked again about this um the the impact of care that lacks compassion and empathy is so damaging absolutely it is absolutely and that you know we need to come away from that mechanistic behavior Karen said, do you think the pandemic and the emergency standards and uh, deployment of student nurses in workforces diverted um, sort of acute um, uh, adult um, medicine, diverted attention from mental health issues while we all focused on survival in the pandemic? So yeah. big. Yeah. I, that was a big question. That was me. The, yeah. It, Karen. <laughs> the, the, that is a big question. Um, I, I, we talked about it in the mental health nurses academics conference a little bit that um that it had shifted um the, the parity of steam that that was probably had had some traction behind over the past 10 years really um to move people's mental health forward uh, um, and, and to try and improve that ha, um, had been um reshaped into covid and uh, and kind of uh, looking after pathology really or, or pathological presentations uh, over mental health presentations so I, I agree I think that that probably is the case um and and specifically with, with that that will carry on as the waiting lists are so high as the government try to kind of manage uh, um the, the backlog and and the lack of staffing um the the work conditions get worse as people move away from nursing which is inevitably happening at the moment uh, you know it's, it's such a shame but it, it will only get worse and and that's why we, we encourage anyone to join our group uh, um at mental health deserves better and you've seen the passion from dan and max and it, get, it gets me all excited about how what we can do and uh, um, but the, the, the kind of final point is that the, the, the central premise here uh, um, that, that we operate from is that we just want things to be better for the people that we work with. And that's that, 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 that's our service users. And I use the term our in the non-paternalistic sense. I was picked up on that the other day by Emma Jones in the non, as in ours in who we care for, um, not as in ours in who we kind of control. Mm -hmm. I think for me, in the relation to the COVID and stuff like that, in the sense of, I think, Gosh, I hope this isn't important because you're frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Just about to win the argument, right? Then. <laughs> <laughs> that is unfortunate. <laughs> um, I, I wonder as well, you know, we're in a situation where mental... Uh, Max, are you back? Yeah, sorry about that, Max. Did you just um... repeat the last thing you said? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Are you messing with me now? <laughs> 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 Um, I guess one of one of things we're, we're talking about though, in terms of this kind of COVID, we're seeing more people anxious, more people depressed, more people worried. Max, you froze straight away again the minute you started speaking. I what know, because they don't want to hear me. I think I'm getting, par I'm going to get a bit paranoid. So yeah, so in relation to COVID, uh, for me, I think people forget that we lose a lot of people um, to, the, to mental health. So, you know, people don't survive, they die because of the lack of support and mental health conditions. So, so for me, even though I absolutely understand the reason why we need to get, we need to grow our profession, don't we? Astronomically in mental health nurses to, to provide support and hope for those people that are waiting forever for their service services and um, we we need to even though I don't want to take anything away from the physical health side of COVID we de they definitely forgot the mental health again it, it was definitely you know what I mean so it's again it's that language and it's that that pop trumping um mental health all the time for me we just big, yeah. you know. the big learning from 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 COVID was that you know people will call you an angel people will clap for you but they won't pay you yeah they won't protect you yeah. And that, I think, is a, is a very hard thing for a lot of nurses to process. 
you know, one of the worst, well, saddest, most difficult things that I came across was I was talking to a student who was talking about how proud they were to be a nurse when people started clapping and they're graduating now, having um, been put at risk and being disrespected and not being paid. And they said, I just feel like an idiot now. Yeah. And I think it's really in interesting how we let that happen yeah. without standing up about it and saying that's not yeah. okay. Yeah. And there's something as well about the way that nursing is constructed to shut you up you know so the way you're a good nurse is to be quiet and then the minute you start talking about education people are like you're lucky to have been sent to school it's just bottom wiping and you're like oh my goodness so it's not just mental health nurses that get this yeah. kind of to, to you know you're an angel <laughs> or you know it's a vocation yeah. I think a lot of different types of maybe female dominated jobs but but nursing in particular really get that kind of treatment and it's very difficult to sort of if you're not used if you if you're used to people liking you it's not very easy to be unpopular like and strike and criticize authority and stand up for yourself so if you are someone who's sort of processing all that not on your own with it lots of people are going through that and trying to figure out what their next steps are and I guess we're coming to the end of our times with by but I guess how can people get involved how can people learn more about this so just just we'll come to each of you for like a little bit of a sort of sound bite to, to close up on. OK, um, so final little ranty bit is that we're more aware of sort of mental health than we've ever been. And you get all these awareness days and stuff, and that's all brilliant. Yeah. But while that's happening, mental health nurses are getting le less mental health in their training. And that mm -hmm. maths doesn't add up for me. Um, I think if you want to get involved, certainly follow the hashtag. Tell your friends about it. I think, honestly, word of mouth and snowballing. Read the manifesto. Uh, look at the library of resources that we've got as well. Familiarise yourself uh, with these arguments um, and, and follow us and, and sort of join join in the argument and share, share these ideas. Mm, absolutely. Come on, Chris. Oh, I, OK. I, I was just going to say, look, you know, if, if, if we convince you with what we've said today, if what we've said resonated in any sort of way, then uh, um, whether you're, whether you're a service user, whether you're a, a, a professional, that there, I think there is a responsibility that we each hold as a citizen in that we need to make life better for one another. And if we have convinced you of, uh, of that we think there is there is a problem here, then then it, then we need to do something about it, or else we become part we can become part of it, don't we? We become part of the problem, and so even just one thing of joining this group or or just reading something and sharing that with your friends or, or, or like I said, tagging the NMC and saying, look, standards are not okay. Um, let's do something different. Anything like that, just one small step, one small thing is is really important. But as a group, we welcome we welcome you uh, um, because hopefully we're all singing up the same hymn sheet that something's not okay. Max, something? Yeah, I hope that it's an exciting time to join mental health nurses, even though we're in a yeah. struggle. I think that yeah, for me, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're, we're absolutely, we're growing and we're passionate. And I think that, you know, and again, for me, it's about having that voice and starting off coming in the courses and saying to us, you know, hang on a minute, there's not enough mental health in it. Fantastic. You know, join yeah. the reps, you know, go to the meetings, go to the board of studies and just say there's not enough mental health. Just like, I know that it might not feel like it, but sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it feels like we were about to get another real zinger. <laughs> Dave, is there anything you wanted to say before we finish up? I suppose it's that uh, whilst we can think that there's lots of things that aren't going quite right, one mm -hmm. of the things that I would, well, there's a few things that I'd really emphasise. One mm -hmm. of the things in terms of mental health nursing is that it's had a period of years where it was cut back relatively significantly. And actually that has turned around that, mm -hmm. you know, we are seeing the number of mental health nurses in England increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that that's absolutely to be welcomed. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is, you know, if you think back to the recent MHNA UK conference, you know, it was, there was a keynote speech by uh, Mark Radford, the chief nurse at Health Education England, and one of the senior deputy nurses at NHS England. There's, really influential important people that absolutely get the importance of mental health nursing and you know to for me i'm not a mental health nurse i'm a health visitor uh, that profession doesn't have that kind of support at such a high level at the moment and it's a profession that's seen 40 percent cuts 
you know, over the last few years. So it's to kind of to balance those issues. I, th I think the other thing that's that's helpful is that, you know, whilst the NMC, you know, no one would imagine that it's perfect, mm. but there is some, you know, nuggets of possibilities there yeah. which yeah. weren't there a few years ago. That mm. It feels like the leadership is much more interested in having these discussions and debates mm. and is much more open to kind of, you know, uh, talking about these issues appropriately. So, mm. you know... I suppose what I hope is that, you know, in the role that I've got, I can help for some of those conversations to happen. I can kind of, you know, push in the places where maybe, you know, the the, the profession itself can't push. Uh, and we can get to a point where we do feel like, you know, it's certainly a more positive picture, even, you know, th th than the kind of positive things that we, we've shared today. Mm. I'm just finishing up, but Mark Haslam, uh, great show tonight all. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. Um, and saying um, a comment, just a comment on genericism means that further alignment with mental health nursing, uh, becoming more neoliberal. And that idea as well about having commod commodification of health. So this is happening within other things as well. It's part of something which is much bigger and really serious in terms of public well-being. Um, Mark Edwards has just um, joined in. I'll, I'll squeeze you in at the end, Mark, saying um, there's a fact that one of the big issues is the ramifications of this won't be seen for a period of time. So like all yeah. changes, the problem pops up much later on. Um, and, and we, you know, we can only sort of like know where we are right now. So it, I guess it takes you back to the points that you guys were all making. So follow on Twitter, read the manifesto, use the hashtag, join in, make your voice heard and learn about this yeah. as well. So really loved hearing from everyone tonight. And I'm sure this is something that's going to go on conversation wise. So we will be looking in um, to see what comments you guys are making on social media. Uh, we're back next week with uh, Dr. Thomas Richardson, who will be talking about psychological mechanisms of bipolar. And that's from his research and lived experience background. So if you're looking to understand more about that, he's a great guy to start with. So thank you very much, everybody. And I wish you all a good night. Good night, thank guys. You. Thank you.